for a unique style of ministry in counseling individuals. I, again, think that you all have unique wisdom. This is what I envision. I envision Wednesday nights, Tuesday nights, Friday afternoons, Thursday mornings, whenever it uh, is made available, or even on the weekends where we have people that come up here and travel around to come up to the lake on weekends, and maybe they're not here on Sunday mornings. Some have. But whenever they're here and we could advertise to them, look, we have means and individuals and a course set or study time to where we are specifically focusing on one particular thing that could be celebrate recovery that could be a uh, divorce care that could be uh, a substance abuse counseling group even a marital marital strengthening group there's plenty of things we can minister to people with and that suffer through or work through similar things this morning we're going to talk about anger so as you take notes this morning, keep this in mind that I'm giving you tool sets as you would go and interact with people, not only in your family or not only with your spouse, and definitely by all means, please do not go home and say, you hear the preacher say, you got an attitude problem, you don't need to be doing that, blah, blah, and get me in trouble. That's not what I'm trying to do. This is, in by all means, if there is an anger issue, this would help alleviate that, hopefully through the Holy Spirit and not with a husband or a wife going around and saying something that could possibly get him in trouble. But this morning, I want to begin in Psalms chapter 4. As I get this ready and get my Bible, look on with me, and we will read the entire chapter, only eight verses. The word of the Lord says this, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry. And do not sin. Ponder in your, your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time and thank you for your word. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who have, and family and friends who have forded the weather. Even the fear of the virus and have come wishing to hear your word spoken. Father God, use me as your vessel. Use me as a transmitter of your word and your message and what you have for us to do and what your word can fulfill because you have made this the perfect inerrant word that is capable of doing much more than salvation, but helping us to walk through lives, to walk through our life, God, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Search our hearts and lead your Holy Spirit into us to examine ourselves, our state of mind, so that we can continue to move forward in ministry and with these tools be equipped to help people. Father God, we love you. And we ask that you bless this time. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Human nature is to know things. I want to know more and more and more. Some of the things I want to know is, what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? These are fundamental questions. 
Why does my wife get to get so mad whenever I ask her to get rid of some of the shoes in her closet? All these questions need answers, and they are found in Scripture. Yes, Scripture actually does talk about a woman in her shoes. Try to look up Song, uh, Song of Solomon chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 16. But humanity for thousands of years has tried to answer these questions devoid of any type of deific interaction. God is not present. We can figure life out without a God. We don't need him. Life can be found meaning without that. But they are trying to figure out life, not realizing that their answers that they come up with are not going to be accurate. They're not going to be anything of benefit. If anything, it'll set up for more issues and more problems. No matter how many times man asks of philosophy, ideology, even any type of worldview, they are going to develop an idol for themselves. See, if God was the centerpiece, they're in the right state of mind. And whenever they try to detract God from their mindset, their life, or anything, they have created an idol of knowledge, science, their own wisdom, their own vanity. Ideology or idolatry runs rampant in the world whenever God has been removed from their thought pattern. Men here have, we don't know if this is allegory, if this is an actual situation for David, that people are berating him and taking his wisdom and his kindness and his godliness and putting it to shame. That's certainly true today. People mock Christians. I've shared with y'all of various authors and scientists in the world, very intelligent individuals that have a remarkable gift of knowledge in science and uh, idea, philosophy, but that look to just berate and downtrodden Christians and Christianity. We're ignorant. We're dumb. Those are the kind words that they would say about us. But those who dishonor God seriously think about this and don't, don't be saddened or burdened by this because think about what God said he would do to those who beat down Christians, those who follow him and those who love him. Be reminded in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 through 24. Remember what happened whenever those 42 boys were mocking Elijah? A couple of bears came down from the mountains and mauled them. Well, that's just a mean God. You serve a mean, terrible, and ugly God. He's just cruel. Well, Whenever I get to preach that text, I have a very good idea of why that happened and for what reason, and you'll kind of be surprised. But God did that because he loves his chosen prophet and his people strongly, just like he loves each and every single one of you, those who are Christ's followers, those who acclaim to the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God will take care of those who choose to berate, badmouth, and downtrodden and be cruel to God's people. God will take care of business. But again, these words that he's using here in this text, we don't, again, know if David is being rhetorical, if this is just an uh, illustration, or if this is an actual circumstance. Surely in David's life and in his ministry and his career, in his military aspects, people were speaking unkindly to him and saying things about him. We have proof of that in the text, but don't know if this particular text is in response to something specific. But these words here is, that he uses is in support of empty speech. These people are looking to idols, to ideology, or their own empty words, their own words of wisdom that lead them to think, oh, the meaning of life is uh, eat, drink, be merry, and just have fun. Do whatever I want to do. If it feels good, do it. 
empty words not founded on anything that God has to say. Yes, if you look at it, Ecclesiastes, there is an aspect of eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Understanding that God is the foundation for our lives. But in the rest of the world, it's, ah, just have fun. It feels good. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it to the fullest, and ain't nobody going to tell me to do it any otherwise. But they're empty. They have no support, no structure to them whatsoever. And you expect life to be founded on this. Do you not see in the world today that people try to develop their own mindset and worldview devoid of God and are surprised at the world being hell on earth? Let's get rid of the police officers. Let's get rid of the cops. Let's defund them. Overthrow the government. Haley had shared with me earlier in this week that this Antifa group was supposedly going to be on Rayburn and uh, Arlay. That they were going to be in boats harassing the boaters. I wouldn't be wise, especially in Texas where everybody and their mamas is armed. But, but their whole purpose is anarchy. They want to destroy government, all systems of it. Are we surprised that the worldview that we, that humanity has developed of even pragmatism, if it works, do it. Well, we could maybe get this world to work without any type of government and law enforcement. <laughs> yeah, right. People are going crazy. And oftentimes it would endanger law enforcement even greater to engage in a certain situation. What do we do? Do we not see these people in the world that just build their lives up around empty words? The word usage here is similar and it mirrors almost with idolatry and people having these little idols and they're always referred to empty and lies. So that's where the speech kind of goes to is either your mindset and how you talk about things, your word usage and all these things, or it's little idols. But either way, our words, our knowledge, our wisdom in this world can be our idols. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I am the God of my own creation. I am smart enough to lead my life without anybody else or anything, any God telling me what I should or should not do. I can get this. It's I, I, I. We have made ourselves an idol. Answer me when I call, O oh God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I, be, excuse me, when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O oh men, how long shall my honor be turned to shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? You see, God is not their provision. Angry people seek man's provisions. Angry people seek man's provisions. I can do it all by myself. I do not need God. I do not need man. I don't need anything else. I can figure life out all by myself. You know, if you look, and I'm a history nerd. I know many of you are not. Some of you may be, but I love to read history. I looked on Netflix and I watched the show because anything that's history, I was watching one on Vietnam War, I was watching another one on World War II, I watched one that was called The Unspoken Truth of the United States of America. All in it, I was like, oh yeah, I know about this. Yes, this is familiar, this is good, I know this. And then at one point, they started speaking about Russia. They made the little flippant statement of, yes, Stalin was a dictator. He, he did cause uh, the deaths of millions of people, but, and then started painting him in a, different, in a different light that he was a good person and that America was an evil nation. I'm not saying we're perfect. God bless America. I hope he does. 
but we are slowly getting so far away from what the founding fathers had originally established this nation to be. Even back then in the 40s and 50s, all these problems that we we're having are probably nowhere near what we are today. We are so demoralized in the world and culture. Do whatever we want. If it feels good, do it. If you look back at hundreds of years before, I don't believe that we had the same issues that we had. Yes, issues were prevalent, but they weren't so huge a deal because the world still knew there was a God. And this was his world. And we are to get in line with his rules, not ours. Because we are going to get ourselves in a whole world of trouble. And guess what? We're paying for it today. We were designed by a creator to have a relationship and a purpose through him to be our all. So, of course, people of the world who are without Christ are miserable and angry because the world is not turning out the way they want it. Right? People are being shot in the streets. We're angry for it. Well, why do you think that they're being shot? Because there's sin running rampant in the world and no one is allowing God in to help them with it. The same thing in our lives. But these angry, miserable people, oh man, how long shall my honor be turned to shame? How long will you love vain words? All these things that are not going to help you. And they're surprised when nothing works out. Of course they're going to be angry. Look at verse 4 through 5. God's provision removes angry, removes anger. Look at this, verse 4 through 5. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own heart, <clears throat> excuse me, on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Ephesians 4 26 is cited from this verse. This is God's provisions removing anger. God's provision removes anger. The idea of both of these texts is that if you are going to be angry, don't sin. For some, this is quite difficult because whenever our emotions get spurred on, it's very easy to step in and say something very ugly to our spouse, to someone driving on the road who just cut us off, to something going on in the news. If you're going to be angry, don't sin. That's essentially what these two texts are saying. If you're going to be angry, don't sin. So how do we do that? We do not say, don't be angry. So here's, here's your tool for whenever you talk to somebody with anger issues or somebody who's struggling with this. Do not tell them, don't be angry. That's wrong advice. Anger is a natural emotion. The sin that follows because of our inability to control that anger is not. That's human nature and sinfulness fighting against our emotions. Don't be angry, but rather don't sin. It alludes to the fact that there may be anger, that there is something, that there is useful anger, that there is righteous anger. It is. God was quite angry with Sodom and Gomorrah, was he not? But that was righteous anger. That there needed to be something done because of it. Just like I told you in 2 Kings with the 42 boys that were bad-mouthing Elisha. There was a reason for that. Many in the world struggle with anger, which leads to sin. How do we help? Not only them, but ourselves. Because here's the truth, we can all testify. We've gotten angry and done something quite ignorant. I have, most definitely. There's been times where I've become angry and said stuff ugly to my wife. I have sinned. First to God and sinned against her. It's true. We're human. It happens. 
Again, we don't tell them, don't be angry. That's not the correct answer. This doesn't resolve the issue of anger. You know, in the world of clinical psychology, they tell you that there is something chemically wrong with you if you get angry. And what you need is to have something chemical introduced to your body to mute out that issue. Now, I'll preface this before I get into say that the world of science has made wonderful leaps in knowledge and wisdom of how to treat certain things. And yes, there are certain things in the world that we do need a little bit of a relief based on a chemical agent being introduced, pills, medicine. We know that there are people even here today that have received medical treatment with an invasive substance that has cured or alleviated issues in your life. Praise God for that. But let me say this, in dealing with, with anger and any other emotional issue in our lives, number one, we should first go to God. That's through his word. This is sufficient. I have friends that whenever I started my training in biblical counseling, they looked at me and said, scripture isn't always the answer. You're right. It probably isn't. But it should be the very first thing we go to to see if there is an answer for it. And there is an answer here about anger. Did you see it? Did you read it? I read it too. You saw it up on the screen. But we'll get there. But again, in clinical psychology, they want you to be chemically uh, induced into some type of stupor because there is something chemically wrong with you. No, you're human. You have an emotion that tells you that there is something wrong. I know most of you are probably not alive yet whenever this book was introduced. This is a terrible, ugly, disgusting book right next to the book of Satan. I read it in school. Yes, I read it in seminary. It is perverse, disgusting, despicable, as it is viewed by many in the scientific community, psychology, philosophy, ide uh, ideology, anything, world of science, as this is almost prophetic. This is like a prophetic book for the world devoid of God. And in it, it actually is called A Brave New World. Don't read it. Trust me. I will give you the cliff notes from it. it it's terrible. Several students actually went and petitioned a teacher to take this off of our uh, 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 syllabus. Thank you <laughs> for the semester. Because we had young ladies in this class. It was like, I don't want to read this nor talk about it in front of these people. But in it, and... Uh, Christopher Hitchens actually writes the foreword for it and discusses the very aspects of this book that was written in 1938 as a view of the future. And what it was is that the world got rid of Christians and those Christians that were left were in caves. They were considered barbaric, crazy people that were thought to be extinct. The world lived by science and everything intellectual like this. No God was there. And whenever the Christians were introduced, they were treated as barbaric. And again, they looked at them and were like, oh, they're weird. They're oddities. Let, let me just look at them. What are you doing? Oh, they're so funny. They're funny people. Oh, and then whenever they start to tell them about a man on a cross and they get emotionally drawn into the story of Christ, they say something like, oh, I wish I had a soma. Soma is a drug meant to subdue your emotional state of being. Again, scientists, colleges, institutions of learning make this a required reading. Because this is what they want the future to be. For people to be so emotionally I don't want to say, well, emotionally castrated, essentially, to have no sense of emotion, to devoid yourself of that. Because it's useless. You don't need it. You know how they do it? It's actually been proven in pharmaceutical companies. They use LSD-25. They scientifically found a way to use this drug to completely get people to remove emotion. 
because your emotions are a problem. You, you're chemically imbalanced. Let me fix you. And people were teaching this in our college and students have read or listened to a radio broadcast the other day of, an, of a young lady who came home to her parents and just started bad-mouthing the dad, saying, you have a terrible worldview. You're a terrible person because you view all these things. It's because they learned stuff in college. Maybe some of you have listened to some of these things that you're a part of the problem and you're chemically imbalanced. You're not chemically imbalanced. The, the corrective thing for dealing with anger leading to sin is found in Scripture. Do you see it? God's provision deals with it. And it is found in verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. Do you see it? This is the fix for anger. Do you see it? We just read it again. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your bed. The answer is simple. Are you ready for it? It's not a drug. It's rest. Well, does that mean I have to go and sleep? No, no, no. Let me, let me teach you a little, little thing real fast. I'm going to show you. Everybody take your hands. You can put your Bible on your lap. Just take one hand. Put it up against your neck, up against your esophagus right here, and you're going to feel around till you feel a little pulse. That's your pulse. If you do not feel a pulse, we need to call 911. Jeff will provide CPR. But do you feel that bump? Okay. I want you to do this. Keep your hand on that bump. I want you to take a long, deep breath and let it out as if you're going out through a straw, very slowly, counting down from eight. Do it again. Did you feel your pulse change? Did you feel it slow down ever so slightly? One more time. Take a deep breath. The slower you go, the better you are. It slows your heart rate. It provides your body rest. That's how you deal with anger. When you get into a situation where I'm just cotton picking mad about everything. You slow your heart rate. You've rested your body. What happens when you go down to sleep? Why it says ponder on your bed. Think about what happens when you go to sleep. Your body slows down. Your higher functions slow down. Food processing, thought process, your body gets into rest to de-stress. God has given us everything that we need to succeed and go through life. And this is good for not just anger, for depression, for everything else, but we'll get there to talk about those things. But it's simply this. Think, rest, and hush. Think about the situation. Take a breath. Think about just that relaxation our bed, what it means there, and then be silent for a second before we say and do something that is going to get us in a lot of trouble with our spouse, or with anyone else in the world. You think if we can deal with problems this way in the world and we can go to people and tell them, listen, I have a way to fix your anger, to get rid of this, to just stop it from becoming a huge problem, and it's found right here. It's not found in a drug. And then you have a prime opportunity to tell somebody about Christ. Finally, look at verse 6 through 8, and we're done this morning. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. David's response to them is, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. God has given the world enough. New Testament, oh Jesus, show us a sign. You don't need it. God has given you everything that you need. 
He is giving you everything that you need. He has given you the joy, but guess what? Most people in the world fail to see it. They don't want to see it. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. God has blessed me immensely. He has given me more joy than I could ever need. But if I don't stop, think about it, rest, and be silent, I will never know about it. The world walks around just angry and bitter at everything without stopping and thinking and resting and being silent. They're never going to see it. When you have these tools at your disposal, and guess what? You can go tell somebody this easily, and you don't even have to mention Jesus right off the bat. And then they'll stop and say, wow. Brother Sam, how did you know that? How did you know to do this? What? That's neat. Where did you get that from? You know what? My Savior has given me everything that I need to walk through life in joy and in peace because His grace is sufficient for everything. Again, I have people that I knew from school that will tell me the Bible isn't enough. But I, I, I think it is. And at least it should be the very first thing that we should go to before going to any psychologist, psychiatrist, head shrink, or anything to be told that there's something wrong with you. And I have the fix. Here it is. I know many of us have dealt with these things in our lives, and maybe you know somebody that has dealt with this. This is part of my responsibility. Part of any pastor's responsibility is counseling. I am here to help, here to talk. I have some tools. And I want to show you how to tap into the joy and peace that lives in you or that you have the access to through Christ Jesus. But we should finally praise God for his rest. The provision that he gives us for peace God has given everything that we need in His Word to succeed. So much joy, so much peace, so that when the day is done, it is time to sleep. And we have peace and safety through Him. People want some big show, but you don't need it. It's there. It's been given. So, we need to take this opportunity and look at this text, seeing that we have what we need and praise God. Finally, I have a video for you this morning. The words are going to be on the screen. It's our text today, put to music. And I encourage you to sing it out because that's what these are. Psalms are hymns. They're songs for us to sing and sing praise to a loving, wonderful God who's given us peace. Go back to Psalm 4. Sing along if you can as we sing this this morning. Mm
So let us pray as we go into a time of invitation. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to gather here.